I did it. Tell me about it. Tell me how it went down. And how are you at sitting there with your dead mom and your dead sister? We're safe. I could tell nothing was wrong, but he was completely normal is also kind of terrifying. This is 19-year-old Alan Ruby. People thought he was a bit spoiled and liked to flaunt his wealth a little too much. But that made sense. He came from the Ruby family, one of the richest and most famous families in Duncan, Oklahoma. Sadly, what followed made zero sense. After the Ruby family was unalived in October 2014, detectives tried to understand Alan's blasé attitude. What they discovered was a monster hiding in plain sight with an outrageous motive. This is the full story of Alan Ruby. Ruby was a well-known name in Duncan, Oklahoma. In fact, they were one of the most famous families in the area and had been for decades. The Rubies had been in the newspaper business for at least 50 years. Al Ruby was in his 20s when he started working as a geologist for Chevron. He would scout Oklahoma for oil reserves and digging spots for the company. But in 1965, he left the company with better career promises. You see, Al had just gotten married and his wife's family had a successful newspaper business, the Duncan Banner. Al went from circulation to advertising and quickly made it to the top of the company. He seemed to have a knack for charming people and making business decisions. He was made associate publisher within five years of starting at Duncan Banner. In 1978, his father-in-law passed away and Al took over as editor and publisher. He would run the business for two more decades before the Ruby family decided to sell the paper and retire. At this point in time, Al had an adult son, John, who had worked by his dad's side for a few years. John continued working in the newspaper industry after the disillusion of the Duncan Banner. And in 2007, he purchased another newspaper, the Marlowe Review. The paper had been around since the 1890s, but it was not well known. After all, Marlowe is a town of under 5,000 people in Oklahoma. In 2013, he also bought the Comanche County Chronicle. It's safe to say he was doing fine, and so was his family. In 1989, John married Joy, whom the family called Tinker. In the next decade, the couple had two children, Catherine and Alan, who bore his grandfather's name. Catherine and Alan did well in school. At age 18, Alan started attending Oklahoma University to study political science. Those who met him at college described him as a preppy boy. Some used harsher words, a spoiled rich kid. To say the Ruby kids were well off would be an understatement. Their parents had established a trust fund for their kids worth a million dollars. However, neither of the children would be able to access it until the age of 21. So they just had to focus on their studies, keep away from a dangerous lifestyle, and the money would be theirs to start a career or a family in any way that they liked. In 2014, Alan was 19 and Catherine was 17 and still living at home. Alan was 75 miles away in a student dorm on the university's campus. At this point in time, John was busy managing his two newspapers and Joy would write crime stories for the Marlowe Review. Before marrying John, Joy used to work as an elementary school teacher, but she was happy to put her love of writing to good use and leave teaching in the past. But Tinker was a busy bee, just like her husband, and in her spare time, she also made managed a real estate investment firm and worked as a licensed private investigator. I know, when does one even have time for all of these activities? But the Rubies seemed to thrive in this full lifestyle and they also had time to spend with their teenage kids. Most people in Duncan knew them well. They were rich, happy, socially involved, the perfect family, if you asked those who knew them. So when they lost their lives on October 10th, 2014, the town of Duncan was left in a state of shock. On the morning of October 10th, 2014, John and Tinker's work colleagues at the Marlowe Review started wondering why they didn't show up. It was unlike them to miss work and not let their partners know about it. The same morning, Catherine was absent at school. Again, this was not like her. She would have texted a friend or phoned the principal's office. After school, Catherine's friend Mackenzie also got worried. She was supposed to visit her for an overnight party, but she never showed up, nor did she answer the phone. When Mackenzie called Joy, she didn't pick up either. The next day, Mackenzie drove by the Ruby's house to check on her friend, but when she got there, she started feeling eerie about everything and drove back home. That same evening, Duncan High School was playing its weekly football game. John was supposed to be there as the team's photographer. He always covered the school's games in the Marlowe Review. Again, people noticed John's absence. However, the weekend would come and go, and no one would call the police. 
Come Monday, the family's housekeeper, Rosemary Chavez, showed up at the Ruby home for work. She wasn't sure she was even working that day. Usually she would chat with Tinker to confirm first, but she thought she'd check since she hadn't heard from Tinker for four days. When Rosemary entered the home, she noticed how quiet it was. This was unusual. The Rubies were always doing something in the house. There was also a foul smell in the air, but Rosemary couldn't quite place it. When she went into the laundry room to get cleaning supplies, she noticed that all of the cabinets were open. The food and water bowls for the family's two dogs were overflowing. Rosemary shugged it off and started working. Half an hour later, she entered the kitchen. The first thing she saw was a pair of feet on the floor, just behind the counter. When she got closer, she found Tinker's cold body. A few feet away, next to the dining table, was John, in the same state. The floor between them was painted red, but it had been dry for days. In a panic, Rosemary started searching for the children. That's when she discovered Catherine, also lying lifeless on the floor. Rosemary had known the family for two decades. At this point, Rosemary phoned 911. She was so frantic that the dispatcher asked her to repeat her statements multiple times. She could hardly form complete sentences. I think they're getting murdered. Yes, the Ruby. Within 10 minutes, officers and paramedics were at the Ruby's home. Detective John Byers was one of the first responders. He immediately noticed the CCTV camera on the corner of the house. This was going to provide crucial evidence, he thought. The next thing he noticed was, of course, there was a fourth Ruby missing, 19-year-old Alan. Rosemary was still at the scene. When John Byers asked Rosemary if she could get in touch with Alan, Rosemary phoned her daughter, who in turn phoned Alan. When Alan picked up, Rosemary's daughter told him to come home quickly. There was a terrible emergency. Before Alan arrived, FBI Special Agent Jeremy Engel turned up. He began a full search of the house, hoping to find evidence and make an arrest ASAP. In cases as tough as this, you don't want to let it linger. Whoever had unalived the family would probably be on the run by now. On the floor, Jeremy Engel found several 9mm shell casings. In the family safe, the detective noticed fresh fingerprints. Now, I know what you're thinking, this whole family was super rich and the whole town knew, so it could have been a violent robbery, right? Well, the only thing missing from the house was the surveillance video from the home security system. There was no sign of forced entry into the house. So no one had come in to steal from the rubies. They had come in to off them. Three hours after Rosemary made the 911 call, Alan showed up at the house. This would have been the first time he was learning what had happened to his family. And yet he seemed emotionless. He seemed unfazed by the law enforcement cars there and didn't even ask where his parents were. When the detectives checked the family record, they found something odd. On October 8th, two days before the rubies seemed to vanish, John had phoned 911 to report a missing weapon, his 9mm. It had disappeared from his pickup truck. The following morning, an officer visited John and John confessed he didn't know if the 9mm had been stolen while his truck was parked at home or at work. However, he hinted his son, Alan, might have taken it. That, paired with Alan's attitude at the crime scene, was a big red flag. The officers approached Alan and asked him where he had been the weekend before. Alan said he'd just returned from Dallas, Texas, and the detectives immediately placed him under arrest. Wait, what? It turns out Alan was on probation for credit card fraud. Leaving his state was a violation of his probation. When he arrived at the station, Alan still didn't know his whole family had died. He hadn't asked the officers about it and no one had told him yet. It's likely this was a game meant for the detectives to catch Alan with a lie. When the detectives sat Alan down and gave him the news, Alan broke down. He screamed, cried, wailed, and fell to the floor. It was so dramatic and so contrasting to his emotionless figure at the crime scene that the detectives just didn't buy it. When he calmed down, the detective asked Alan to give him a full timeline of the events from October 10th to that day, October 14th. Alan said he was at his dorm on the night of October 9th and even showed them a Facebook post as proof. In fact, this picture had been uploaded on all of Alan's social media platforms. Then Alan drove to Dallas to spend the weekend with his friends and attend a game. He tweeted this picture of his college roommate Andrew Borman lounging in their suite. He did say that he'd spent close to $20,000 the month before and that his parents were kind of upset about that. Yep. Here's the thing, 
Alan was a compulsive shopper. He loved exhibiting his wealth and wanted ever more expensive luxuries for himself. Remember that credit card fraud? Alan had opened a credit card in his grandmother's name and spent $5,000 on a trip to Europe. He had 25 pairs of designer shoes and would go to college in a luxury car. He had also set up a public figure Facebook page, painting himself as an important person. It's pretty disgusting how he thought just being rich makes you important. His family had some privilege, but they'd worked their way up. He didn't do anything except go to school. Still, he wanted to be admired, desired, and even envied. On his social media platforms, he described himself as an up-and-comer and a shopaholic. Alan Ruby is a self-confessed shopaholic with expensive tastes. This is what Alan wrote on his blog. There is no bigger rush than getting to the register at a store and swiping your credit card. And in that moment that you are waiting for the screen to say, approved, you start to get heart palpitations and you get a rush of adrenaline. But by the time the clerk is handing your stuff to you, you are so high on adrenaline that the $15,000 total does not even phase you until you've gotten home and you've seen your receipts. Yuck. Halfway through the interrogation, the detective asked Alan if he'd offed his parents. Alan said of course not, he loved his family, they'd done so much for him. But the detective knew he was not a grateful child. Alan never had a job, and yet he gambled and spent thousands of dollars every month on things he didn't need. He was a materialist and a flaunter. And yet, the Rubies were not billionaires. As the detectives came to find out, they were quite upset with Alan's spending habits. In the 2010s, the Rubies felt a drop in their revenues as printed papers became less and less popular. They had actually started to cut down their spending during the last few years. And yet, Alan's spending increased every year. On October 28th, 2012, Alan tweeted, All I want for Christmas is a less psychotic family. Hashtag getting ridiculous. The problem? Tinker had confronted him about his compulsive shopping. A few days before Christmas of that year, Alan put his hands on his mother's neck. Tinker called 911 and Alan was arrested for domestic battery. In the end, Tinker insisted that her son be kept at home and not sent to juvie. She protected him, but in 2013, the family cut him off from their money. Alan wasn't going to end his spending habits though. So he turned to his grandmother, who suffered from dementia. She was easy prey. She could not say no to him whenever he asked her for money. Alan would drive the poor woman to the bank and milk her bank accounts time and time again. A few months into this, John and Tinker caught him red-handed. Once again, they protected him from law enforcement as they didn't want to ruin his future career. So instead of phoning 911, they drove him to the county courthouse to speak to the DA. He was warned, but Alan seemed completely unfazed by this meeting. He even continued to tweet proudly about his shopaholism. Then he forged his grandma's signature and opened a credit card in her name. That's when his parents called 911 and had him arrested. While on probation, Alan borrowed money from a loan shark to continue his lifestyle. When he couldn't pay it back, the loan shark started making threats. Alan begged his parents for money to go to Dallas that weekend, but they refused. That's when he told his sister that he would unalive them all. Catherine was really upset about it, but she never thought that her brother would actually go on and do it. With all this information, however, the detectives had enough to do a full search of Alan's dorm and car. They found a bunch of stolen objects and fake checks bearing his grandmother's name, but no incriminating evidence. The following day, Alan failed a polygraph test. That put him into a state of panic. He felt like he'd been caught. Not thinking clearly, Alan said, I know who unalived my parents, the loan sharks. But the detectives had a simple answer for that. The loan sharks would have left with every valuable in the house. His story did not add up. By now, the detectives had also received the results from the lab. The fingerprints lifted off of the family safe were Alan's. When he was confronted with this information, Alan cracked. I did it. Tell me about it. Tell me how it went down. Who did you sh first? My mom. When my sister was home. She was outside washing her car. <laughs> my dad was at work still. How much longer before dad came home? So. An hour you had to sit in there with your dead mom and your dead sister? 
or something. Alan said it was either him or his family in the eyes of the loan sharks. Then his real motive became clear. He wanted his parents' money and he wanted to be the sole heir. That's why he took his sister's life too. Ruby admits he slaughtered his own family in cold blood. Prosecutors say after Ruby's parents cut him off financially, he snapped and killed them to inherit their money. After unaliving his parents and sister, Alan calmly went back to his dorm and talked to his roommate. There was nothing different in his demeanor. That's one of the scariest things, is that I was with him, just alone in his room, less than 24 hours after he shot his family. And I, could, I could tell nothing was wrong, that he was completely normal. Investigators also tracked down Alan's stolen surveillance footage and the 9mm to a storage unit rented by Alan's grandmother. There was enough evidence to convict him. Alan pleaded guilty and received three life sentences. From prison, Alan wrote to the Oklahoman saying he welcomed the death penalty. I 100% welcome the death penalty. What occurred is so horrible, it is deserved. It is so unspeakable. This has been by far the hardest thing I have ever done. I lost my entire family at once. I didn't feel like myself that day. This was not something that seemed like a conceivable option. Why? I'm still trying to figure that out. Oh, it was hard to do it? Did you lose your entire family that day? Poor you. Over 1,000 people attended John, Tinker, and Catherine's memorial service on October 19th. As part of his plea deal, Alan agreed to never contact any of his family or profit off of his crimes in any way. His last desperate attempt at getting attention was his letter to the local newspaper. Alan will never get attention, and he will never be envied for his riches ever again. It's shocking to think taking out his family would solve his money problem. Did he have zero understanding of the consequences? Did he only see his family as a cash cow and his sister as a hurdle? Alan's story will forever haunt what's left of his family and all those who knew the Rubies. Thanks for watching, you guys. What do you think about this case? Do you know similar stories? Leave a comment, like, and subscribe. See you next time.